And so for those reasons, I believe the crankbait is the most versatile and fruitful lure you could possibly have. Well, that concludes this week's discussions. I uh, want to thank everybody for coming out today. And I also want to thank our newest member, Andrew, for showing up and joining us today. Now today is, is Independence Day. A lot of people will be celebrating in a lot of different ways. Uh, some of you will be going, for instance, to town tonight. They'll be doing the, the, the fireworks there in town. Let me give you a, a suggestion. Let's do a little fishing. Why don't you grab some of those cards out there, take them with you when you go to the fireworks thing tonight, and when you see families there, just walk up and say, hey, I want to invite you to our vacation Bible school. You don't have to have a long conversation. Just throw the lure out there a little bit. You know, just throw it out and uh, let, you know, let, let them do the biting. But just pass it around a little bit. Pass those cards uh, at, the, at, the, at the fireworks this evening. Grab a bunch of, there's a bunch of them out there. Get them. We only got two weeks left. I believe that us talking about it is going to be, I don't care how much advertising we do, I don't care how much anything else we do, it is word to word, talking to people and inviting people and doing things. You know, Jesus chose ordinary men fishing along the shore to join him in the challenge of the word. He wasn't looking for perfectly polished preachers or magnetic ministries. He wanted, he looked for hardworking people who would simply you know, sometimes we ask about, you know, say, well, I, I don't know. I'm just not able. God is not looking so much for ability as he's looking for availability. He wants us to be available to do his work. You don't have to be someone special to join in the work that God has for us in this world. You just have to simply be willing to follow him. That's what we're going to be talking about today, the idea of following Jesus, of being hooked on Jesus and doing what is new. We're doing this series we started last week called Hooked Series, and it isn't about pirates. It's about a series on fishing and fishermen and nets in the open sea, which we talked about last week in our first lesson. We looked at a particular set of scriptures there last week, 
In Matthew 13, 47 to 48, it says, Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that is let down in a lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad away. That's what we looked at last week, that particular scripture. And we expounded upon that verse. We're going to look at it a little deeper today into Jesus' original interaction with some of his disciples. We're going to talk about who they were and how they responded to the call of Jesus. What can we learn from the apostles' response? You know, a, a, a full third of the disciples, four out of 12, were fishermen. That says something to me. What kind of broader implications of spreading the kingdom net is he talking about when we look about how Jesus called these men? As we learned last week, it is our job to participate in the spreading of the kingdom net. You know, again, we said that the kind of fishing we're talking about is not what you would do with a line and a, and a particular type of lure, but rather throwing a net, casting it out, getting all kinds of fish of all kinds of areas, and then sorting them out later. We let God do the sorting, we said. God will do his part, and he invites us to do our part in the process. But it all starts with a divine invitation. So let's get started. In our main passage for today, you know, it's astonishing to me that Christ gets such a profound response from his simple words of, come follow, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. That was his invitation. Come follow me. If you have your Bibles, be finding Mark chapter 1, 16 through 20. It says, Passing along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, the brother of Simon, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and I will make you become fishers of men. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. And going a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, who were in their boats, mending the nets. And immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. Notice that. Just simple, follow me. The invitation to Jesus is a simple one. You don't have to have a complicated response to what God has called us to do. You don't have to have all the answers to all the questions that everybody ever asks. Jesus simply said, follow me. It's not flashy. It's not padded on promises of good life. It, it, it's definitely not the kind of compelling sales pitch that you'd normally want to elicit the level of response that you see coming out of these guys when Jesus called them. He is, after all, the Son of God. But think about it for a minute. He is the son of God. But what if you were Simon and Andrew? What if you were in their shoes? I mean, wouldn't there be a question? Wouldn't you say, you know, okay, well, what are we talking about here? When you say, come follow me and I will make you fishers of men, what's, what's in it for me and what are we going to do? And wouldn't you want a little more information to make a final decision? At the least, wouldn't you want to call a friend and say, uh, this guy's asking me to come. What do you think? The whole sin, the, this scene makes me think that there must be something else going on for them to respond the way they did with just a simple call of Jesus, follow me. So John, I think, gives us another one. Actually, the Gospel of John helps explain maybe a little further why their response was the way it was. It says, John chapter 135 and then 40 through 42 says, the next day John was there again with two of his disciples. We're talking about John the Baptist, by the way. When he saw Jesus passing by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. Then in verse 40 to 42, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who heard what John said and who had followed Jesus. The first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah. This is the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. The point here is that the Gospel of John makes it clear is that the original disciples already had some idea who Jesus was. John the Baptist had already been telling people, like we read in John 135 above, 
I love the book of John, by the way. It begins with, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word, what? Was God. By the way, anybody who doesn't believe that Jesus is God, just start right there, First John, uh, uh, the book of John. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. So you can't say, well, no, wait a minute. He's talking about God the Father. God, you know, no, he, it, it's, it's God the Father, God the Son, Holy Spirit, not God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. In the beginning was God. In the beginning was the Word. What's the Word? The Word was Jesus. Jesus said, I am the Word. The Word was Jesus. And you see it in the creation. God spoke. Jesus is the Word. So, anyway, but John gives us a little more explanation. John the Baptist had already been telling people, like we read in John 135, that Jesus was here, he says. He doesn't say he's the Word he said he's the Lamb of God. Now, the Lamb of God is in reference to the sacrificial Lamb, the Messiah who they were waiting for, who would be the sacrifice for all the sins of all the people for all the times. Not to mention, in that day, news traveled pretty, pretty easily and fl flowed pretty regularly. If something happened, it, everybody just kind of passed it down. You have to know there were whispers of the Messiah at the dining table, at the trading posts in their fishing boats as they were fishing. Hey, you know, uh, John has been preaching this thing and the, this Messiah is coming and, and this and, and, and one of them said, you know, I, oh yeah, I was there and all this. So when Jesus shows up in front of Andrew and Simon Peter, he says, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. They were ready to go. When John pointed out Jesus to his disciples, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When the apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Jesus. When you ask your neighbor to come to a special service at church, when any of these things happen, there's an invitation being, being extended. And when we extend the invitation, we extend the edge of the kingdom net. In our country, we don't necessarily have, we, we're kind of like they were. Most people have heard of Jesus in our country. Most of your neighbors have heard the name of Jesus. They, they have heard a little bit about him. They, they've, know, they, they've been talked about and they've seen it and, and they, they probably own a Bible. Most people do. The, the number one seller in all the world for all the times. It, it, I mean, they, they know a little bit about it. So the ground has been prepped a little bit. So when we go to someone and we say, hey, come follow me, it shouldn't be a surprise. But the problem is, is we need to extend the invitation. Think about this for a moment. The gospel means good news. And all of us today are willing to invite anybody into the good news when we have something to share that's good, don't we? We don't mind telling good news. A new job, a promotion, a grandchild, a, a, a trip to, to the Caribbean or something like that. We're going on a cruise. We don't mind sharing the good news when we've got good news. The gospel is inviting us by nature because good news is always worth sharing and we need to share it. Is it good news? Is it? Then why aren't we telling people? The last week we talked about how the kingdom net gathers fish of every kind. Remember that? We said last week that when you throw out that net, they threw it out. It went to the bottom. It caught all these different fish. They gathered them up. And at the end, they had to separate them. And that was kind of a, a, a picture of how God was going to do that he was going to separate them in the end. It's not our job to separate the fish that God does that. But we, we, we saw that, that, we, that fish of every kind and, and said another way that the net indiscriminately gathers the fish. This is a great reminder of us as we spread the kingdom net to others. If we'll share pictures of our kids to strangers on a plane, why wouldn't we share the good news of Jesus to that same person? Maybe we think we have to, you know, we have to save it for those who are really ready for it. I think that's what we do. You know, maybe we're acting like kingdom screening agents. You know, or maybe we need to remember that it's not how Jesus did it. 
We learn the disciples are not perfectly polished, polished group. They're not the kind of people that you would expect to be carrying the good news of Jesus Christ. I mean, think for a moment the kinds of people that gathered together through Jesus and, and in the Gospels. And these are just some of those we know about. Peter, an uneducated and a very mouthy fisherman. Zacchaeus, who is he? A tax collector. Matthew, who is he? Another tax collector, despised by the people, the lowest of the low, traitors to the people. Mary, who was about to be stoned because of her sins. If these same people were pre-screened for their kingdom worthiness, how many of them do you think would have made the first cut? Jesus tells us in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. And, and, and we learn elsewhere that he gathered groups, those groups, what they might look like. John's vision in, in Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. After this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude. Not one could count. No one could count. For every nation, tribe, people, and language standing before the throne and before the Lamb. They were wearing white robes and they were holding palm branches in their hands. And then Isaiah tells us in Isaiah 49, he says, I will make you as lights for the nation that my salvation may reach the ends of the world. Who are you for God? You know, we sing the VBS song, this little Christian light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. And we say, hide it under a bushel. No, I'm going to let it shine. We sing all around the neighborhood. I'm going to let it shine. Let it shine all the time. Let it shine. Well, why don't we? He says, I will make you as a light. I love this for the nations, not just for Crossville, Tennessee, but for the nations. When they see you, when they see what you, you do, and they see how that God has affected you, in and through Christ, we know the invitation is extended to all. No pre-screening, no value assessments, whether or not this person is worthy or not, or whether they will respond or not. We, we take two extremes in our, I think, in our approach to people a lot of times. We'll look at people and say, you know what? That person will never respond because they're too well off and they're, they're, they're doing so good and everything. They don't need God. At least they don't think they need God. And so they'll never respond. So I'm not going to talk to the mayor. I'm not going to talk to the judge. Or I'm not going to talk to this person who's, who's very well off because I know that they're going to just reject it because they don't, they, they don't think they need God. Or we'll take the other extreme and we'll say, that person is just so low down, they would never even think about God. Well, if I were to tell that person about God, they would laugh me in the face. They're so far gone, I don't know whether they could ever come back. We take either one approach or the other to most of the people, and we have a narrow group of people that we think that might be worthy. And honestly, those are probably the least receptive. We need to look at people, all people. Our job is to throw out the net. And let God do the sorting. No value assessments. Just the good news of saving faith. And what we see in response to Jesus and his first disciples was a radical response to that invitation. It was an immediate response. Faith. As I've already mentioned, the original disciples probably heard whispers of Jesus. John the Baptist was busy preparing the way of the one who was to come. And we know from the original timeline that Jesus was baptized, whisked away in the desert for 40 days of, uh, of, of temptation, and, and he began his ministry. It's likely that the early disciples had heard some inkling of what was going on. So let's look at the response of Andrew, Simon, James, and John in Mark chapter 1's passage there. Simon and Andrew. Look what it says. Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you become fishers of men. And listen to this. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. While James and John, and immediately he called them and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired servants and followed him. 
The gospel of Mark highlights the, the immediacy with which these disciples responded to Christ's invitation. In fact, they li literally walked off their jobs to follow Jesus. Simon and Peter dropped their nets while James and John left their father standing in the boat. What an incredible sight. What an incredible response. Can you even imagine walking out of your job, answering a call of God? Some here today, you may have changed your job because you knew it was better for you to do something somewhere else. For others, this is an example, an ideal of what it looks like to exercise immediate faith and obedience. That's hard to do. But it ought to be the response we have. You know, I think about in my ministry seeing people who responded that way. I remember back years ago when I made my first trip to Russia, I went with a good friend of mine. He, he's a veterinarian. He, he, I mean, he was very successful in his practice. This guy was making money. He was doing a great job. He had the only veterinary clinic in town that was, I mean, he was, he was, he was the veterinarian for Scottsville, Kentucky. Him and I went over there. We saw the need. We decided, him and I both talking about the idea of going over there. We, we converted some people. Uh, originally, we had just a handful of people there that was baptized, but our, our hearts were, were hurting in the fact that we were taking these newborn babies and, and just leaving them there, and we called it spiritual child abandonment. And so we got back. What amazed me was Craig, his name was Craig, sold his business moved to the Ukraine where there was no church, established the church there. That was probably, I think, there were thousands of people who obeyed the gospel. What if he hadn't done that? I wonder if that area there, by the way, it was one of the growingest areas around. There's an overreaching principle here that sounds something like when Jesus calls It'd be good to answer. And for the rest of us who aren't Jesus, it's our job to simply extend the invitation to everyone we can. That's what our job is. Our job is to extend the invitation. We, we gather in here. You remember the video we watched just a few minutes ago? It was kind of funny, but kind of wouldn't. You know, we're here today. Why are we here? We're talking about going fishing. I mean, really, every time we get together, our reason to get is to encourage each other and to worship God, but also to go forth from this place and take the gospel into all the world because we've been giving a commission to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. <coughs> We're supposed to be going out and getting people and bringing them in. We're supposed to be going into the highways and byways and bring them in. Some will respond in haste. Some will take a month, even years, and some will, will never come around with that invitation that we give them. Their response is between them and God. You see, so many times I think, well, you, you, we, we'll say, but, but we ask them. Well, good, ask them again. But we ask them again. Well, okay, ask them again. You know, by the way, they say it takes an average of eight invitations before someone will respond the first time. Eight. But guess what? There's going to be some who will never respond no matter how many times you ask them. But guess what? That's not your problem. Your job is to extend the invitation. Your part, it is God's part. We talk about our part and God's part. Our part is to extend the invitation. It is, it, and, and then their part, it is God's part and their part to respond to it. If we do our part, leave the rest alone. Leave the rest of it to God. Their response is between them and God. But invitations is something we're called, I would even say commanded, to be a part of. So, what are we supposed to do? Drop our nets. Step out of the boat. Start walking with Jesus. Inviting anyone and everyone to come along for the ride. It's the greatest, most amazing and challenging journey that anyone will ever take. 
But if you are a Christian, you have an obligation. Oh, you know, we talk about all the different things that Christians ought to do. I mean, you ought to be at church. Don't forsake the assembly of saints. And we ought to give and we ought to do all these things. Listen, we ought to be talking about Jesus. We ought to be telling others about Jesus. We ought to be responding to the gospel call. If we don't, who will? Maybe today you're not a Christian. I want to, I want to give you the simple invitation. Come to Jesus. I would say come follow Jesus. It's simple. You know, we try to complicate the gospel so much. We try to make it so complicated, you know. I, I, I think of some of the people that he called. He didn't call them and say, come follow me. When he called these guys, he didn't say, come straighten out your life. Once you get your life all straightened out and get everything just right, then you can come and follow me. He said, no, come follow me. He takes you where you are. But he loves you too much to leave you where you are. But he takes you where you are. God will take you where you are right now. All you've got to do is follow him. Do you believe in Christ? Are you willing to turn from your sins? Are you willing to confess your faith in Christ? Are you willing to, to be baptized, immersed in sin, become a new creature, rise up to walk in newness of life, and simply follow him? If we can help you do that this morning, I want to encourage you as we stand and we offer the invitation.